Hello, hello, beautiful souls. Happy Wednesday. How are you guys doing? Hello, Jennifer. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? How is your week going so far? I hope you guys are having the most amazing day. Um, for just a reminder for those of you who have never met me before, have seen me before, I don't know who the hell this woman is. I am Paula D'Souza. I have been um, in the beauty business for over 20 years. I am not just a makeup artist. I believe I transform lives through um, my talent of enhancing your beauty. And I also help women to connect with or reconnect with their inner beauty because a lot of times women think, oh my God, when I'm done doing the makeup, they look so amazing or whatever the case is. But guess what? I am no magician. All I do is enhance your beauty. And today with me, I have a beautiful soul. Her name is Rishon Sigopoul. Um, I think there's a, another name attached to that, but I'm going to let her give you all the details. And I hope you are ready to have the most amazing conversation today. Remember, this is not a dialogue. This is a monologue. It is not a monologue. We want to have your interaction. So feel free to ask questions. You have um, a expert, a holistic expert with us today. And I am looking forward to diving into her journey and um, sharing with you. Hi, Dicia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So without further ado, I am going to allow Rashawn to introduce herself to so tell us who Rashawn Ramp is around. Sigo Paul. Where the hell are going to hide me, boy? <laughs> Sigo Paul. But you, you have a, um, what's your, your, the other name that's attached to your last name? Ram Ram. <laughs> You see, Ramboran. So I just got a little bit tongue tied and mixed up. So let me know how you guys doing on the outside. Um, feel free to pop in and you know um, share your views, share comments. So I'm gonna hand you over to Rishon so she can introduce herself and let her let every one of us know a little bit more about her and who she is and what she does. Hey everyone, um, my name is Rashawn Siegel-Paul. I am a holistic health and wellness uh, therapist. I currently live in Georgetown, Guyana, and I own and operate uh, Moksha. Um, it's a holistic health uh, and wellness center, and we do various types of therapeutic massage. We do cupping, we do dry needling, we do Reiki, uh, non-surgical fat removal, counseling, a bunch of stuff. Wow. So now that you've told us what you do and about your business, who is Rashawn? Um, someone who really likes tea. I like <laughs> uh, reading books. I prefer when it's raining. Um, I'm a bit of an introvert. Uh, I like music. I'm a mom, a wife, a dog parent. <laughs> oh, wow. I know you have some furry, furry babies. How many do you have now? I have uh, six plus seven. My dog had puppies, so I have seven puppies. Right. Okay, uh, okay. Right so that's a lot. So how do you manage? And because I know in the beauty business, it is so demanding and your clients have given you the, the auspicious title, D-O-A-T, massage therapist. So how do you really manage that? Because I know um, you also do energy work and anytime, because of who you are holistically, anytime you put your hands on someone or anytime you're interacting with somebody, you are automatically releasing energy so how do you manage and balance your energy with your work time? And when you get home, you have all the responsibilities at home. How old are your children? I have two kids, a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old. Okay, well, they're not too bad, but they still need your attention. So tell us, how do you balance that? How do you, um, like when you get home, do you need an hour for yourself before you attend to your family? Or do you just dive right in? Um, so usually uh, what happens is I, I need, just as you rightfully said, I need, uh, you know, a bit of time 
uh, you know, to myself, um, just to kind of process what has happened uh, during the day and to also kind of, uh, you know, let it go because um, there is definitely a transference of energy when you when you put your hands on people and it goes both ways. I mean, patients get energy from, uh, you know, the therapist, but you also pick up vibes, uh, you know, from your uh -huh. patients. So you do need uh -huh. to be able to kind of, um, you know, let these go. Uh, I take famously long showers because for me water helps to kind of literally you know wow. wash away everything so uh when i say i'm gonna take a shower it's never like a five minute affair we're talking maybe 20 minutes to half an hour and uh most of it is just kind of standing and letting the water literally just kind of wash uh you know everything away but girl, guess what? You just shed some light there for me because I don't, well, these are not conversations that we have on a regular, even with our girlfriends. I am somebody who take very long showers. My shower time, my bath routine is not just a regular jump in the shower and jump out kind of thing. Yep. And for me, there's something really, really special about water indeed. I mean, I can't wet my head every single day, but I can let the water fall from like around here and it's just absolutely refreshing, especially after a long day. And uh, so I'm so happy that you share that. So ladies, um, if it's something that you've never indulged in before, try taking a nice long shower. And do you also mix the water? Um, the, sorry, it's very loud. The shower situation that I have- Is it loud from my end or is it oh, your from end? My end? From my end, from my end. The shower situation that I have doesn't really allow me to mix, uh, you know, water. Um, oh, okay. But I do tend to light up some candles, and so um, you know, in the bathroom, and it's it's helpful. Um, oh yes, I take, yes, yes. I take full advantage when I visit my parents because they have hot and cold showers, and I take hmm. uh, again pretty hot showers when um, yes. you know I visit them. But yeah. Mm -hmm. But for me, I think I start off with, um, I'd never be with very, very hot water because I don't believe it's the best thing for your skin. But I love when I could go into the shower and take a, um, do it like lukewarm. And then at some point I turn it to the coldest of my body. It does something to you. So if you didn't know, now you hear it from the holistic um, expert, having long, cold or cool showers, it really is a great way to revive your energy. And I have a lot of um, massage therapists as well who are in my circle. So I'm happy that you share that. And um, what do you have like a skincare routine? What is your skincare routine like? How do you take care of you? Um, I have a skincare routine. I don't think it's a very, uh, what's the word? A conventional skincare routine. Um, mm -hmm. I try to do a body scrub whenever I remember, but really the, uh, the conscious kind of skincare for me is getting tattoos. <gasps> what about your face? We're going to talk about your tattoos because to me, I think tattoos if, are if, so sexy. If I was allowed to tattoo my face, it would be one of the first places to tattoo. Um, but like skincare in terms of face, what? I have a pretty basic cleanser that I use. I try to exfoliate maybe about two times a week. And mm -hmm. um, I use, um, I think it's something with retinol in it. It's supposed mm -hmm, to be mm -hmm, lines. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Because right. I'm getting up there in age, so we need to kind yes. of make sure that the retinol is being used to get rid of the lines. Yes, because guess what? We want to look as youthful for as long as possible. Hi, Moses. Thank you for popping by. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Camila. Hi, Juliana. Saying welcome, welcome, welcome. You guys, guess what you can do? Hit the share button and let's get more people joining into this amazing conversation. So tattoos when were you first introduced to tattoos when did your love for tattoos became a thing um i've always had kind of a fascination with uh body art i remember being quite young and traveling in the subways in new york and you would see people that were kind of uh you know very heavily tattooed and i, I always thought that these were some of the most beautiful people i'd ever seen right right so I've had a, a fascination with, uh, you know, tattoos and even 
you know, like body modification and this kind of thing for as long mm -hmm. as I can, you know, remember. Right. So where did you grow up now that you mentioned New York? Oh, I grew up in Guyana, um, but uh, travel was something that was a priority for uh, my family, our family when we were growing up. So okay. um, my parents always made sure that we, uh, you know, kind of saved money to be able to, uh, to, you know, to travel. So a lot of my dad's family lives in uh, New York. So that was one of the places that we would go to, you know, to visit. Okay. Family. So if you don't mind me asking, how old were you when you went to New York for the first time? Mm -hmm. I would say maybe eight, nine, ten. Around the stage. Okay, so why I, I did that because I wanted to establish how young you were when the first time you saw these people. Because my first experience seeing um, people who are very expressive in their art form was mm -hmm. when I spent some time in the UK, and that was in 2000. I was already in my 20s, mm -hmm. and I really admired the way how, you know, as we were referred to them as the punk rocks. You know, they have the hair and all these styles and colors and the tattoos and the leather and the spikes. And it's like, I usually watch them with my jaw drop, you know. <laughs> so um, how old were you when you get your first tattoo? Did you knew from um, the beginning what you wanted? We have another tattoo. Before you answer, there's another tattoo fanatic here. Um, this year, tattoos. I am here for this. Totally love it. <laughs> Yeah, how old were you when you had your first tattoo? And did you? I was know? eighteen when 18. I got my first tattoo. Yeah. And oh, it your was, parents. What, it was what they call um, a tramp stamp. So ah, just okay, off the lower okay. back. Yeah, and it was supposedly my name in Chinese. Um, I remember mm -hmm. going to a Chinese restaurant, and I had asked the waiter to write my name in Chinese. I didn't right. speak Chinese, obviously, and his English was not amazing. So really, right. it could have been anything that he wrote on the paper, egg fried rice, wonton soup, whatever. It could have been whatever oh. he felt like writing. And um, this was the first tattoo that I that I got. Right, but it's not amazing um, because um, you have no clue what you what you um, what you have there. If it was real, did you ever had a chance to um, verify whether or not it it is what it is? Uh, no, actually, I never asked, uh, but it's covered now, so it's oh, okay. So, guys, for those of you who who are um, who are watching and listening, Rashawn, like myself, she's a blogger too, and she has a. Um, if you want to read about her tattoo journey, she has a blog on um, Medium. What's the name of the story? Uh, Kiss my ink. Kiss my ink. Right. So check it out. I'm 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 also gonna share it on my wall when we're done. So I have, before I go on, I have one question because of course we want to have it as interactive as possible. I have a question here from Moses, Moses Bob, and he says, I would love to know if there is a spiritual connection to Rashawn's chosen path. How did she navigate the fear and how was that transition? So I'm so, it's like this guy, he's like he's picking my mind. You remember when I spoke to you? So guess what? This is how I'm going to let you answer that question, just because of time. Um, I know that you, when you were, um, you were attending medical school, right? You had a scholarship for, I think it's Cuba. And so let me let you tell the story. So the question is, as he's asking, and I also want to ask, you know, how amazing was it that adversity was the thing that definitely led you to your path? So give us the full story. Right. So, um, I was given a scholarship to study Western medicine in uh, Cuba, and you know, I went uh -huh. and I started the program. And through the program, it it was kind of obvious that I've always been somebody that has been very holistically minded. Um, it's difficult for me to detach. Uh, you know, the leg from, say, the spirit, you know, I think it's all kind of connected. Um, so long story short, short, I basically ended up dropping out of medical school um, while I was on a, a scholarship. 
um, because it was something that wasn't really kind of resonating with, uh, you know, what my my thoughts of, of, you know, where I should be, you know, where. Um, and it wasn't a situation where I was bad at medicine. I think um, ultimately I would have made a pretty good, uh, you know, doctor. I was uh, smart. I was understanding what was, you know, kind of happening. But it just it was it, it wasn't kind of sitting, you know, well, you know, with me. I felt uh, a little bit hip hypocritical, maybe if, if this is a, a right way to say, um, you know, with uh, kind of treating patients but not being able to treat holistically. Um, so I dropped out of medical school, came back to Guyana, and then really still had not really an idea, you know, of what, you know, I would do or where I would go. And, um, I ended up going to, uh, region nine. So this is closer to the border of, uh, Brazil in Guyana. And I was, uh, working with a radio station, teaching them how to write, uh, scripts and, uh, teaching them actually how to use the radio. And uh, my younger brother was there with me, and he ended up getting in an accident uh, where there was a significant injury to to his uh, to his head, to his brain. Um, he had already been accepted to a university in Malaysia to study uh, journalism, mass communication, this kind of uh, you know arts uh, program. Um, so they were trying to figure out how really you know to get him to go, and the doctors were saying if he has someone who will look after him. Um, you, know, you should be able to go. So this is what I, you know, then did that I, I agreed to go to Malaysia to, you know, spend a year with my brother. And uh, while I was there, it was then that I kind of discovered, um, you know, a university that, that looked at complementary medicine, that looked at massage therapy, that looked at Reiki, that, uh, you know, and it was just a really perfect fit, um, you know, for me. So... <laughs> This is kind of the condensed version of the story. Right, right, right. So what was it like living in Malaysia, um, especially coming from an English-speaking country and going off to a distant land that, you know, you had to kind of learn the language, learn the culture and everything else. What was that that transition like for you? Um, not so much of a transition because my mom is actually Malaysian. So I have Sorry? a very large... My mom is actually Malaysian. Okay, okay. I have a very large uh, family in in Malaysia. Um, ah. So the transition was not very difficult. Um, in terms of like the climate, it's very similar to, to Guyana, uh, a little bit drier. Um, and then of course, growing up with a Malaysian mom, the food that we ate was very similar to, you know, what they have in, in Malaysia. So it wasn't that much of a, you know, that much of a transition. I would say the bigger oh, no. transition was probably going to Cuba than to Malaysia. Oh, okay, okay. So that's that's a whole different thing, um, because and so how did um, okay? So I know you said that you um, discovered that you know they had there was this university there that would have catered to your needs, and um, so when you just you decided to get into the, to it, how did everything? start shifting for you so because prior to that you didn't really you weren't sure exactly what you wanted to do so how was it how was it shift because i know a lot of time people think that um when you're pursuing your purpose yeah you have to see everything line up but that generally that's not how it is so what i want what i would like you to do is just share your experience and how your transition worked from that point to this point yeah, so definitely, I think when I started, it was not something that I saw myself making a career out of. Um, I first started with uh, like massage classes in the evening because it was right. just something to kind of do to, you know, to kind of, you know, pass time. And, uh, you know, slowly, slowly getting into um, the naturopathic medicine side of it um, and mm -hmm. even doing my Reiki level two and, and mastership and this kind of thing in Malaysia. Um, you really kind of saw how things were, were uh, I guess, falling into place, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because there was always an idea to kind of come back to Guyana and to, you know, to work and to live, uh, you know, to do something, no matter what it was that I, you know, wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to do it in, in Guyana. Um, right, right. But definitely in the inception, it was not uh, kind of like I'm taking massage classes with the idea of opening moksha in Guyana. 
it was it was right. a situation where you know uh, I need to kind of do something because mentally there needs to be some kind of stimulation. Let's right, do a massage, right. but, you know. So yeah, definitely not. But um, I, I think sometimes we expect to to start, and you must be able to see the end when you start. Mm -hmm. And I know for me that uh, I have always been someone that. By nature, I trust kind of my gut. I trust my intuition. You can kind of lay everything out for me, logic out for me, And if intuition or says, "Oh, you go the other way," we we usually go the other way, right? Um, right, right, right? So I think for me that this was also something that was kind of ideal or crucial, um, you know, in the situation that it okay. felt like I was doing the right thing even though I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with the thing if that makes sense yes I, it makes perfect sense to me because it is it's, it's really exciting to hear someone else say it so in a nutshell what you were really doing was trusting the process as you went along yeah and how important would you say to somebody who's listening and not sure how important is it, is, is it, or what really does it take for us to trust the process in order for us to get to our, I would say, but not ultimate destination, or just to discover our purpose? Um, it's a tough question because I think it varies from individual to individual. Um, mm -hmm. What I would say is that I believe that you're never given more than, than you can handle. Exactly. So I think that even though it might seem like a very daunting situation or it seems like you're kind of jumping head first or feet first or whatever into this great unknown, that mm -hmm. you kind of need to trust the fact that you kind of innately or inside you, you have what you need to kind of come out the other end. If you know if that makes sense i don't know yeah um, it does there's no kind of I, recipe there's no kind of uh there's no know, formula kind of step one step two kind of thing you just have to yes you know kind of trust that what is right for you will happen um it's a lot easier for me to sit here and say this now because it's been uh you know basically almost 20 years you know when i started my journey and and i'm here now um it's definitely not a situation where I say you have blind faith and you just do. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to kind of work. There were months where I was kind of questioning, is it really worth opening a massage place in Guyana? Are people ready mm -hmm. for this? You know, I have bills that right. I need to pay. There are other things that I could do to, you know, kind of earn money. Um, so it's not a, I would say not an easy kind of straight, straightforward journey, but it is definitely something that is, is worth it, 100%. Right. And would you say passion is the one thing that is important to exploring your purpose? Passion is important, yeah, because it, it, it ha you have to love what you do, right? Um, uh -huh. if you count the number of hours that we're at, at work, it's the majority of the day. So yes, you yes, need yes. to do something that you love, because otherwise I think it's a situation where you end up being pretty bitter and, uh, you know, just very resentful. Um, but right. if it is you find something that you know that you love and that you're really truly passionate about, it's it's exciting to go to work. You're always learning new things. You're, you know, it's it's great. Yes, and um, like if you if I could take you back a little bit because, like, as you know, I'm also from Guyana, and when I came to Trinidad, I was not fortunate enough to have. Um, family members who were there to support me and, and that stuff. So I literally jumped into an adventure on my own. But one of the things that I personally discovered along the way is that when you're pursuing your purpose and you and you pursuing your passion, it's like the universe just lines up everything and everybody who is there. How, how was that for you? Was it the same thing as well? Definitely. Um, I think that this was kind of one of the ways that I knew that uh, you know, like new to trust the process then because things would fall into place. Um, you know, it was kind of, you're doing things, not really knowing what the next step was, but then suddenly something would, you know, kind of come up and it's like, okay, yeah, we're on the right path because this is the next, the next thing, you know, you had right. people that were supportive. Um, 
after doing the massage classes, I was kind of like, then what? And something else kind of came up that would have been the next step. And I'm like, okay, so we're in the right way. We're in the right path, you know, kind of thing. Right. And what would you say is your most memorable experience and um, one of your lessons that you learned from that experience that's still guiding you to now? Um, hmm. I think I would probably say this was uh, an incident that happened when we were in school. Uh, uh -huh. So the school that I uh, went to, we were fortunate to be able to uh, not just study, but we would also see patients. So it would be school in the morning and then patients in the afternoon. And um, I remember there was a patient that uh, came in and he was losing uh, lots of weight and all the tests that they had run came back you know, normal, everything was fine. Um, and when we spoke to him, he was of the opinion that he had been hexed by his neighbor. Okay. Uh, so in Malaysia, they call it BOMO, which is, I guess, equivalent to Obia here in Guyana. Right. And in Guyana. right. So mm -hmm. he had was convinced that the neighbor had done some kind of Obia, you know, on him. And mm -hmm. of course we laughed because this was, this was pretty funny, right? Um, we were thinking, mm -hmm. you know, we're here in a medical institution that looks at medical massage and it's all very proven. And the professor says, okay, you guys are gonna treat the obia. So we were kind of like, <laughs> how are we treating this obia? Like, you know, what do you want us to do now? Uh -huh. So the professor sent us all over the place, right? He said, you go and get some leaves from the yard, you go get some dirt, mm -hmm. you go get some onion skins. And I don't know, he made some sort of concoction and we mm -hmm. went back to the room of the, the patient and, um, he basically lit the entire thing on fire and then asked everybody to, to say a prayer, right? He says, whatever prayer, whatever language, you know, whatever. He said, just offer, you know, some blessings. Mm. So we still thought it was pretty weird and we left it for the night. So the next morning when we came back, um, you know, to do rounds before class, the mm. guy had gained five pounds overnight. Um, and we were kind of, you know, shocked and, uh, he was discharged later on in the day with just advice to kind of see if he could sort things out with his neighbor. So I'm not saying that I bring Obia as a practice into, you know, into my work, but for me, what was kind of the important lesson is that your mental state really does play a really important part on physically how you heal. Yes. And so, for me, this just that, kind of solidifies the whole holistic, uh, you know, aspect of it, because really this is what I try to do with the patients. Like you'll come in and right. you'll tell me about some back pain that you've had for two weeks, but we look at mentally where you are. We look at emotionally where you are. And in some cases we look at even spiritually, you know, where you are, because all of this will have an effect on your, on your back pain. On your physical, and yes, 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 yes. So this is the way that we treat, and this is something that has kind of stayed with me, you know, for, for a while. And I think it's also made me a little bit more open-minded um, to where the patients are coming from. Um, right. So I am, by, by religious practice, I am, I am Baha'i. Um, mm -hmm. But I have had Muslim uh, patients pray for me. I have had Hindu patients pray for me. I have had Christian patients pray for me. Um, I have had uh, people bless, you know, the office and my hands and all kind of thing. And it's it's amazing. And this is something that they feel it's useful, um, you know, for the betterment of their treatment. It's not something right. that I necessarily kind of agree with, but you know, it's, it's helpful, you know, for them. And if right. it's helpful for you to heal, we will do it. Right. Because basically at the end of the day, I think um, we are all connected by the by one source, even though we may be treating it as Hindu, Christian, whatever, whatever. But um, interestingly, I want to, um, something jumped into my head while you were talking about the experience with the patient. And I wanted this to see how you feel about it. Isn't it the same thing as what they refer to as the placebo effect? Because there are some people who are so wired to think that every time you're ill, you have to get medication. And there's this belief, I think it was, um, that was, it is, um, what's his name again? Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm seeing his face. Um, it's actually three of them that I follow. Um, Bruce Lip, 
Bruce slipped on for some reason. He's coming. His name is coming to mind. Oh, Doctor Doctor Joe De Pizzo. Mm. Right. So if you ever get an opportunity, check him out because he was um, um, he had an accident that damaged his vertebrae and spine and whatever. They told him that he would never walk again. Yada yada yada. And he basically um, ch changed his mindset. Changes eating habits and everything, and he was completely healed and he's walking again. So he has dedicated his entire journey to doing this type of research. And um, he wrote a book called The Perceivable Effect. So when you get an opportunity, you can check it out. But isn't it amazing how um, we don't realize, or the average person always think that as soon as you're ill, it means something is definitely magically wrong with you. And all that to me, I think from my even from my own observation, uh, because I know when I'm stressed, especially with um, how the pandemic has affected my income. Whenever I'm stressing about money, I feel like I store most of my stress in the lower part of my stomach. Um, what is mm -hmm. that called? Your, your, um, your, um, your sacral uh, chakra. Yep. Is it? Right. So that and I and the, the vibe that I get from there is like I get like a bloated feeling. Sometimes I get um, um I'm constipated, yada yada yada. Um, but once I address it and I release that whole tension of worrying and stressing, it really does magic for my body because it restores. I feel good. I don't feel stuffy. I don't feel bloated anymore. So how, um, what is your thoughts about your stresses can be the cause of your ailment? I mean, yes, there are some people who definitely have medical issues, right? But what are your thoughts about that? Oh, definitely. Um, so we, with a lot of the patients that I see for Reiki, this is kind of, you know, what the thing is. Um, mm -hmm. It's a situation where a, you know, a, a mental and emotional problem ends up manifesting itself physically. Right. Um, you know, so just as you're saying that, um, you know, sometimes people with anxiety will end up with, you know, lumps and bumps, you know, kind of in the stomach and, uh, you know, the same issues, issues with, uh, you know, constipation and, and this kind of thing. So, um, you know, with Reiki, this is where I see a lot of this kind of, uh, you know, thing. So it's, uh -huh. you know, yeah, definitely something that, um, you know, I've worked with. All right. So let's swap Reiki stories. When was the first time you heard of Reiki? I'm going to tell you my encounter. So I have this client who I met. Um, as a matter of fact, I wasn't one of those people who wanted to be a makeup artist. Makeup artist, makeup artistry chose me. So when I was told, oh, Paula, I have a bride for you to do, I went into panic more because Paula didn't even have a makeup kit. But fast forward, um, this beautiful soul that I'm about to tell you about, she was one of the bridesmaids um, at the wedding. So I've had the opportunity to work with her on and off over the years. And she said um, to me, she said, Paula, do you know you have the most soothing touch? Every time I'm sitting in your chair and you touch me, I just feel like I want to fall asleep. And that is something that a lot of people would have uh, commented. Even when I was doing hair, it's like, how you just do that? I don't even feel your hand in my head. And she said to me, have you ever tried doing Reiki? Have you ever thought of doing Reiki? Because I think you would make a great um, Reiki therapist. Mm -hmm. And it was probably in, um, maybe back in sometime in, in early 2000. And that's when I did my uh, Reiki level one because it just so after that everything's just because you know it's the way how the universes work. Once they drop a line on you, and you get curious about it, the information just comes. So tell me about your experience and how did you encounter Reiki? So funny enough, it was also in about two thousand two thousand one. Um, I was living in South Africa at the time, and mm -hmm. where I. I was doing in South Africa is uh, I was part of a performing arts workshop. So we used the medium of dance, of music, of drama to kind of raise awareness uh, for the social issues in, in South African society at the time. Right. Um, we're in South Africa, where are you? 
which part? Well, this is what I was going to say. We moved around every maybe two or three weeks. So I traveled the wow. length and breadth of South Africa, staying in maybe a village or a township or even a city for maybe about two or three weeks at a time, depending on how big the place was. That so is awesome. It was, of, it was pretty cool. And um, I was part of a team where it was 10 of us from nine different countries. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really good mix of uh, you know gender and culture, and um, it was it was really great. Um, so we were in a, a really small uh, village that what they did was uh, mainly raise cattle, and wow. we were kind of like maybe two hours away from uh, you know a drugstore, a pharmacy, a supermarket, anything like this. And I had a, a really bad headache. I don't know if it was because of the heat or you know what, but it was a really bad headache and I, I usually don't get headaches. So one of the uh -huh. girls on my team, I was, you know, you know, trying to ask anybody if they had, you know, a paracetamol or something. And she says, No, she says, But I can reiki you. And I said, You can what? Okay. And she goes, I can reiki your head and the headache will go away. So I didn't really listen to the beginning part. I just heard and the headache will go away. So I said, right. you know, you need to do and uh you know we'll, we'll, we'll uh you know see so she put her hands on my on my head and it was definitely some really weird sensations um mm -hmm. the headache did go away but i didn't pay too much attention you know to it afterwards it was when right. i had come back to guyana and um i met with a woman named rolinda curtin uh, uh -huh. So Rolinda was my first Reiki master, and uh, when I think she was having a class and she advertised, and someone told me, "Oh, this Reiki thing," and I'm like, "I've heard this word before." I was like, "Where did I? You know, where, why do I know this word?" Um, you know, and then I remembered. I said, "Oh yeah, this is the headache removing thing." I said, "Well, it might be useful to learn if it can, you know, help to get rid of headaches." So I decided to go to the, the level one attunement, and uh -huh. um, it was a really bizarre, uh, I think, class for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Because everything thus far had been very kind of logical, and and if you do this, this will happen, and if you right. you know if this is not working, this will also not work. Right. Reiki was very esoteric. It was very kind of you couldn't quantify anything, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. we're dealing with energy, but we don't know how much energy, and you can transfer it, but we don't know how fast it will transfer, and we can do this. So it was just kind of very heebie-jeebie and kind of in the air, you know not really here or there. And I said, you know, I'm not really sure about this, but it wasn't too expensive. So I said, you know, okay, we can, you know, afford to kind of spend the money for the experience. Right. Um, and when she was kind of talking about, uh, you know, the way the energy flowed and visualizing a light and I'm thinking, I said, light doesn't flow. So already you're not making sense to me, right? <laughs> and so I was kind of like water flows, light doesn't flow, right? So mm -hmm. I, said, I said, let me ask. And everybody else in the class was, oh, yes, I feel the light flowing. And I'm thinking, you failed a Reiki class, Rashawn. Like, how, you know, how is this possible? Yes, um, yes. And then she was saying about visualizing white light, and I couldn't see this white light. So I decided at the end of the first day to kind of tell her that, you know, maybe this is not for me because everything that you're saying that should happen, I'm mm -hmm. not seeing it, right? right. Um, and we spoke. And the light that I am able to visualize is a golden light. And so, she was very excited. It's a golden light. Um, right, so she yeah. Was very excited because she said, you know, she said, my Reiki master spoke about people like you. And she said, mm -hmm. there are many people that can kind of do this. She said, you need to kind of continue. You need to kind of figure out, you know, how to get this energy flowing. She said, because to see golden light is not normal, right? Right, yes. Um, I was kind of like, oh, okay. And I'm thinking, I said, here, I thought I failed the entire course. And, you know, trying to tell her that, you know, please don't fail me too badly. Um, right, right, right. So I actually started to practice as a level one practitioner with her um, just to kind of learn how to hone the energy and how to uh, manipulate, you know, the energy. So it was definitely something that I wasn't really... Um, not really expecting. I thought Reiki was very weird initially, but um, mm -hmm. now something that has really kind of become a part of, of uh, you know, who I am. Right. So my other question is, because I know I told you one of these days I want to have a conversation with you so I could pick your brain. And, and I believe maybe now that we're talking about it, it came up again. And I want to ask you, um, because my bra my background, I, I, I kind of like went into... Um, Christianity for a little bit in my, my journey earlier, like in my uh, from my late teens into twenties, 
So I have had experience with that light on a different level, but I think my challenge is um, the whole religious aspect, my religious upbringing, and now coming into in, um, coming into contact with this so-called energy that you know anything outside the church. You remember they, they they teach you that it's like not good and it's evil and whatever. Did you have a struggle with your whole um with the with this gift that is natural and it is from God? Well, of course, at the time I didn't know that. How was your struggle? How do how were you able to overcome that struggle with your gift and what you were taught? Um, I don't think in the Baha'i teachings uh, there is anything that that kind of speaks against uh, Reiki. I, I I mean not not to say kind of badly about any other faith, but I do actually have friends who are Christian that uh, studied Reiki and were told that they couldn't practice it because uh, laying of hands is something that is only reserved for certain, uh, you know, like members of the church. I don't think in the Baha'i faith there is anything like that. So um, I never really had an issue, um, you know, with kind of like a, an inner conflict in terms of faith and energy and, you know, this kind of thing. Um, not, not really. Not really. All right. Well, I'm going to use this opportunity to, to allow you to speak into someone who definitely has a gift, but is, is having that internal conflict within themselves as to whether or not it's the right thing. Because to me, I, I'm going to just give you like a real quick thing. Um, it all depends on which religion you kind of come up in. And I know I'm going to contradict some people because... The gifts are not exclusive to just one person. All of us have it. All of us have it. We just need to access it. Because I can tell you this, a friend of mine invited me to um, the Catholic Church. I have a, 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 a section that they refer to as um, charismatic. And she kept telling me about, oh, they have the service and there's a girl. I don't do church. Because a long time ago, I said, you know what? I want to unlearn everything. And I want to learn what resonates with me, what I know that I know that I know and not what just somebody else told me. So I wasn't going to church and she kept hanging me and hanging me and hanging me. So I, I decided to indulge her. She said, oh, we have this healing priest that's going to be there, blah, 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 and So I got to service. Everything went well until he says, okay, uh, some people here who God has definitely chosen to work as a healer, blah, 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 whatever the case is. And I'm feeling it, right? And I was like, you're not talking to me, <laughs> you know? And next I knew, I felt a hand on me. In the church, you know. And I go on up there and I stood there and he was standing, walking around praying. And next thing you know, I mean, the same experience happened to me when I had my, my, um, my attunement. I just felt this gush of light. And the same experience happened to me and I couldn't tell you, I was on the ground, I was bawling and carrying on like a crazy person. And so I share that experience to say that it's, to me it's unfortunate for people who are so far uh, in the matrix that they don't understand that this gift is for everybody, it's for all of us. We could just access it. So what I want you to do now is just use this opportunity to speak into someone who have the, the natural gift of healing, but there is a conflict there. How do you get rid of that? Or how do you manipulate it to come out and do what you know you're called to do? Okay, so um, in the Reiki story, what they teach is that, uh, at least in the way that I learned, was that uh, Reiki was something that was rediscovered by Dr. Usui, right? Um, right. So they believed that it was knowledge that had pre-existed, um, you know, or was pre-existing knowledge that uh, somehow got forgotten or got lost, and he rediscovered it. So I think mm. it goes back even into science, where they tell you that energy, uh, you can't create it or you can't destroy it, it just changes. Um, mm -hmm. I had a Reiki master that used to say to us one time that uh, Jesus was a Reiki master. Uh, yes. Because of the fact that he healed with the laying of hands, which is very similar yes. to in Reiki practice. Um, yes. You know, so this is kind of what I would say that I think a lot of times we tend to label 
uh, you know, it has to fit into kind of a, you know, one box. But um, for something like Reiki, it, it is really, you know, universal healing energy. And it, it for me, it kind of surpasses anything else. Um, so whether you're a Muslim or Christian or Hindu or, you know, you know, Baha'i, whatever, um, innately, we all have this ability to to heal, regardless of you know, what faith you, you know you follow. Um, I would say that Reiki is also not a religion. Um, there are some kind of principles or ideologies that you are expected to, uh, I guess, kind of follow. But it's mm -hmm. it's not in any way you know a, a religion. And this is the, the principles that you follow would be also something that uh, in any major religion they. They kind of advocate for you know so things like earning your living uh you know honestly respecting your elders um don't be angry don't worry uh you know this is the kind of you know reiki principles that um you know you're expected to follow so it's it's not a religion it's not dogma um but it is something that innately everyone has the the ability or the gift to be able to heal and um it's just a matter of being able to kind of unlock you know these uh, potentials about um really is that I see those five principles when i heard it for the first time it resonated so hard deeply with me that i was like yes this is just the way how we should live i mean i'm not bashing christianity but i recognize because i was in it well you know, i recognize that christianity is a lifestyle you know and re just like Reiki is a lifestyle. And what I love about Reiki um, from my discovery is whether you believe it or not, it works. Yeah. And as a, um, um, as a makeup artist, I have people who would sit in my chair. Sometimes I don't even have to have a conversation with them. And, when I, and then also when I start doing eyelash extensions, I recognize that I don't even have to activate my Reiki energy. It just pulls. If the person lay down there and they're stressed or whatever the case is, I would definitely feel my hand popping. So um, um, I know we will talk a, a lot more about this offline at, at some point because I still have a lot of questions and um, because I don't have, unfortunately for me, the first Reiki master that I connected with, he was living in Antigua, not Antigua, Grenada. So right after he moved and he went to Grenada, went back to Grenada. And then the Reiki master that I did my level two with, she was living in Tobago from Germany and was on her way out. So I felt as though I was just left with no guidance, just what I read in. So honestly, it's not something that I, I do on a regular, but I do have friends and, and, and the circle that I'm in. I'm getting a lot of fly, creepy things anyways. Um, they're doing what they're doing, I'm doing what they do. Once they don't fly at me, <laughs> yes. So, I'm so grateful to connect with you and, and to be able to have, have questions, have somebody to ask questions um, from and you know to shoot ideas. And I really love um, um, how important is Reiki in your everyday practice? Do people come to you just specifically for Reiki, or is it something that you incorporate in your treatments? Um, we don't have that many people who come in for Reiki. Uh, I think uh, part of the problem is, again, because it's, it's very esoteric. It's very unmeasurable, not quantifiable, you know. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So we don't have many people coming in specifically, specifically asking for Reiki. But mm. um, I am a, a Reiki master, and I think that this is what makes me um, an exceptional therapist. Right. This is my hands, right? Yes. Um, yes. The Reiki tends to make your hands super sensitive. Um, yes. I am able right now to put my hands on patients and I can tell if there is something that you are not telling me. And right. it just makes the, the session so much more holistic. So, mm -hmm. um, it is something that I would recommend to anyone um, if you want to kind of up your up your practice, up your game, up your level, whatever you say. If you work with your hands in connection with people, you should do Reiki. So whether yes. if it's your anesthetician, whether if it's your a doctor, a therapist, a lawyer that has to kind of deal with mediation, it will really up the level of what you are able to kind of give to your, you know, to the people that you serve. 
Um, yes, I totally agree. I totally agree with you because there's something happens like you have a deeper connection with your intuition as yep. well. Yep. And uh, well, okay, I'm going to ask you this question because for me, there was a little struggle there. How do you trust the knowing that this is something that's coming from divine, your, your divine higher self and not your intellect? How do you go about or how did you go about trusting that, you know what, what I sense is not just um, my intellect talking to me or my ego or whatever the case is. How do you trust that knowing? Um, so for me, the way that I was taught Reiki, it, it was very, um, so the line that I learned from was the Usui line, and I'm actually able to trace my lineage back to uh, Dr. Usui uh, through my Reiki, mm -hmm. Reiki masters. Um, so it's a very pure line that I, I studied with. Um, right. There's a lot of, uh, I would say, kind of practice that you need to, you know, to do. And we were always taught that you are not, uh, like the energy that you're, you're channeling doesn't come from you. Like you're basically yeah. a strong, right? So you have to be right. open to, uh, you know, basically channel, um, you know, the, the energy from yourself to the patient. Um, so I always ask also my guides, uh, you know, for help. I ask the guides of my patients, you know, to be there to kind of assist them. And it's very funny because a lot of the times patients tell me, how many people were in the room with you? And I'm kind of thinking, I said, is this a spiritual question or physical? Like, you know, what, what level do you want to know? And they're like, you know, we're sure that we saw like three sets of hands. And I'm like, yeah, this is probably my guys or your guys or, you know, somebody extra, you know, came to kind of give a, you know, give a hand. Um, right. So it's just kind of, I would say, the practice that, at least for me, that I, I go through. Um, I meditate before a session. I pray before a session. I make sure that I am kind of covered in, a, like, a bubble of, of light for, for my personal protection. I ask my guides to be there. Um, the, the, the kind of precautions, I guess, that I, I put in place, uh, it's, it's not likely that it could be something that is ego-related or... Right. Uh, you know, and I, I, I kind of at the beginning of each session, I will ask, you know, like, uh, you know, can we try to direct the healing energies for the, the, the greatest good of, of the patient? So it's not to kind of say to make me look like an amazing, you know, Reiki master or, you know, whatever. But it's it's always done for the good of the patient. Everything that we ask is for the health of the patient, the healing of the patient, um, progress of the patient, you know, whatever, however you decide to, you know, to, to work yes. it. You know. Yes, so it's definitely pure, pure, pure energy. Yeah. Right. So I want to ask you one more question on this Reiki thing before we move on, because, you know, you just have an hour to do this. And guys, if you are here, if you have any questions, just pop it into the comments because we're going to be wrapping up shortly. I really um, want to take this opportunity to say, guess what? I really do appreciate you. I really do appreciate you, Rishon, because you are sharing with me your most value, valuable asset, which is your time. And time is something that we don't get back. So I really appreciate this. And I know that everybody who comes into contact with this conversation will get something from it because you're, you're channeling information. So my curiosity question is, um, how do you, or how did you start your relationship with your guides? How did you know who your guides were? Was that something that you had to be taught or was it something that you um, you kind of discover on your own? So uh, the first Reiki master I worked with, uh, Rolinda Curtin, this was kind of one of the things that she was very particular about um, that uh, she always would say to me, make sure that you ground. She said the energy needs to be able to leave, right? She said, so she said, just like a straw has like an opening and a, like a top and a bottom. She said the energy needs to be able to come out. You don't want it stuck in you. Um, so grounding for her was important. The fact that you needed to be able to kind of put up a, a shield for want of a better word, like a protective bubble was also uh -huh. important. And she also uh -huh. stressed on, on guides, right? So she would say, um, you know, she would always encourage you to kind of look for signs. Uh, she would encourage you to do meditation and meditation specifically with the idea of, of meeting, uh, you know, your guides. 
uh, you know, looking, yeah, so like I said, looking for signs, the meditations, um, she said, kind of pay attention to dreams that, you know, because for me, I, I don't usually remember my dreams. If I remember right. it's something that is very important. And I try to like write it down, you know, as soon as I wake up to, you know, to be able to remember it. But she would say, you know, remember the dreams that you've had, look for signs. And she said, you know, when your guides are ready to kind of show themselves to you, she said, you will know. Uh -huh. um, so to date, um, I would say, and this is this this would have been since I, I would have started doing uh, Reiki, which is almost, uh, I don't know, maybe more than 20, maybe 25 years, you know, ago. Um, I have two guides that I am, you know, aware of, and these are people that have been with me since I have started, um, you know, kind of my Reiki journey. Uh -huh. Okay, well, guess what? Um, and not to put my, well, I didn't first call the person name, but my first Reiki experience, never. We never had a conversation about guides and grounding and all that stuff. Those are things that I learned, I read about along the way. So, um, I really feel that I I need somebody to kind of like guide me because I know that I have a lot to offer and I have a lot to give and um, I want to be able to do it properly. So that's why I think part of me never really dive into practicing. Um, I mostly give Reiki to people who I know. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then um, I remember my first experience giving Reiki to somebody who I didn't know. She was going through some stress and um, and I said, I said, you know what, before I start the treatment, I'm going to give you a complimentary 15-minute session. And when she told me her, what her experience was, I knew, I mean, and this was like after the whole experience with the Catholic priest. Because, I mean, I'm supposed to know that I know that I know then. Um, but I, I really do know and I believe that um, I have to get to that place where I stop second-guessing myself. And I guess it's all about connecting with the right person because all of us need a mentor. And that is what I'm lacking in that particular area. So I'm grateful for um, Richard. And Richard, um, he just absolutely <laughs> adore me. He absolutely adores you. And he always, always connected me with really like-minded people. And I'm so grateful. So um, uh, let me just stop and see what Alberta Marsh is saying. Hi, Paula. Great talk. I wonder if this Reiki treatment could help persons with stress and high blood pressure. What say you? For sure. So, uh, let um, Rashawn um, answer that question. So answer that for me and then we'll move on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Reiki does help a lot with actually uh, high blood pressure and stress. Um, I think there is no treatment that Reiki would not, uh, you know, be beneficial for. But um, a lot of the people who come into the clinic um, kind of specifically or, or consciously is the right word, um, you know, asking for Reiki, usually it's a stress-related uh, you know, issues. So people who have insomnia, yes. people who are dealing with maybe postpartum depression, um, it's all very kind of stress, uh, you know, driven situations that we, we treat with, uh, with Reiki. With Reiki. And I know for sure that almost everybody who I give a Reiki session to is be flat out when I'm um, maybe halfway through. They're just totally snoring. I remember that experience like yesterday. In the Reiki, um, in the class, the first in level one, because level two, I was a one on one session with me and the, um, the master. And uh, so we gave each other Reiki sessions um, as, as practice. And I probably was the only one who wasn't sleeping. So the Reiki master told me I got trust issues. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Miss Marsh is one of my school teachers. I hope you um, you heard that because um, what Rashawn does at her clinic is she definitely she just don't treat the problem. She helps you to get underneath. Is not what holistic treatments is all about. So we help you to um, I say we, but we help you to get underneath the root of your problem so that um, you can dig it out. Because if you keep treating it on top. Then it will just heal on the top and it will just be there underneath and at some point it will come up. Isn't that how it works? Yep. So uh, Miss Marsh, if you're in Guyana, book a session with um with uh Rashawn so you could go to her um to her clinic and have a wonderful conversation with her. I wouldn't take on that responsibility because to me I still I I don't feel like I'm ready, ready. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I don't feel like I'm ready, ready. So y'all, you have about uh, maybe 10 minutes more or so to pop some questions in because we're gonna wrap up. So my one of my favorite um, questions that I love to ask every guest um, because I, I look forward to because everybody response is so dynamic. What are you most grateful for? So many things. Um, I am pretty grateful for the fact that I have an amazing uh, support network, um, you know, in terms of uh, my family and I would say friends that I call family. Um, it's not plenty of them, but, uh, you know, the ones that are there have been kind of very supportive from, uh, you know, from day one. Um, I am grateful also, I think, to be a woman who does this kind of thing um, as, uh, as a business. Um, and I'm sorry to all the gentlemen who are listening, but I do feel that women are kind of more innate, the healers, the, you know, this kind of thing of the, um, you know, society, not saying that men are not, but I think right. that women have a very special, uh, you know, gift, uh, you know, for this. Um, I am grateful that uh, I was actually able to find what I would consider to be my true calling um, mm -hmm. because I really, really, really enjoy what I do for work. Um, I don't think that, you know, I would do anything else. Maybe, right. you know, I don't know, take care of, of dogs or maybe cook. But <laughs> the same oh, do you give me a dog Reiki? Uh, you know, yes, I do give my dogs Reiki. Okay. And um, um, you mentioned um, your support system. And I know that you're happily married with your two beautiful kids and, you, and all your furry um, babies. How important is it to have a supportive partner in this business? I think, honestly, this is, this is half, the, half the thing. Um, my husband is an amazing, amazing, amazing person. And I'm not saying this as his wife, but person to person. Um, uh, he's incredibly supportive. Um, he also does Reiki. He's a, a level two ah, practitioner. Um, right. So we have a connection that is more than I would say just a physical bond. Mm -hmm. uh, we do vibe on a on a on a very energetic, you know, level. Yes. Um, you know, he's someone that I can complain to. He is someone that I can laugh with. He is someone that I can say to him today, I love you, but I don't like you. Um, you know, he is somebody who will feed me, um, that I know that uh, he will be there, you know, should I need more than, you know, what he is currently giving now that he, he would be willing to give. So I think wow. having someone who is in your corner, no matter what the day is, no matter what the battle is, is, uh, you know, kind of half of the struggle already. Right. So I, that I don't is just... think that I would have been where I am now without somebody like him. Mm -hmm. And that is just so absolutely amazing. I'm a diehard romantic. I'm a sucker for a good romance story. So let me tell you what I heard there. There is this thing that is in the Bible that talk about being unequally yoked. And I, from your conversation about your relationship, you guys are equally yoked. Because I know for a fact that there are a lot of women and men who are gifted healers but because they're because of their partners who don't understand the spiritual side of it, they are having a very hard time being who they truly are. So how important is it for you to be in a relationship with a partner that understand your calling and understand who you are spiritually and understand who they are spiritually too? Because it's a as as there is this one guy as it's a vice thing, and you have to be able to connect on that level to be everything that you are. If you don't have that support, then you will have nothing. Yep. Yeah. This is, this is it, uh, you know, like I said, uh, I remember a funny story. Um, when we were about to get married, um, my, my mom had a, a friend who was very into, or is very into Chinese astrology. And uh, she's a lawyer in Guyana. And it's very interesting because her practice, um, the very first thing that she will ask you is when your birthday is and she right. looks at your astrology and she kind of applies it to the whole legal situation. It's interesting. Um, you know what yeah. she does. Well, 
I remember my mom gave my birthday and my husband's birthday uh, to her and said, you know, is it a good match? And um, she said, oh, these two, you don't have to worry about them. She said, these two are together forever. Here, the next life, the other life. And my husband and I both said to my mom, we're like, mom, why did you waste the question? Like you could have asked something else. Like we know that we're together <laughs> in this life and the next life. And the, you know, you wasted a whole question. Mm. So yeah, he is definitely somebody that, um, you know, uh, yeah, he's he's my person. Yeah, he puts do you up think with that, the crazy. Do you think you're with your twin flame? Was that sorry? Do you think that you're with your twin flame? Um, quite possibly, yes. Because it does sound like a twin flame connection. Yeah, it does sound yeah. like a twin flame connection. So, how are you guys doing on the outside? Um, so my next question is, um because i wrote special questions for you so i need to get to my notes <laughs> all right um oh i want to ask you a question about chai because i fell in love with chai tea um a couple of years ago where did you have your best cup of chai let me tell you my relationship with tea changed when i traveled to, when i spent time in the uk i was working in the store and the guys were Pakistanis. And I tell you, these guys made the best cup of tea ever. And they're not in the kitchen, you know, there is a little kitchenette in the back of the store, and there was a stove. And it's the first time I saw people boil the, the milk with the tea bag in the milk. And OMG, life changing. Where did you have your best cup of chai? <laughs> um, it's not a best cup of chai, but I've had pretty good cups of tea in Malaysia. Malaysian, uh, Malaysia. they have tea something, it's called te tare, but it's the same way you would boil the tea in the milk. So it's a very rich, very creamy, um, you know, kind of uh, drink. So te means tea and tare means pull. So they, they kind of pull the tea in two cups to kind of cool it down. And it gets this nice kind of frothy, uh, you know, yes, I see them. I, I saw my parents doing that. My mom, when the tea is too like hot, an to from one cup to the next, to the next, to the next, to the yep. next. And I've seen that because I watch a lot of documentaries because I'm a, a travel fanatic. And in the last year or so, we couldn't go anywhere. So I discovered a lot of places through watching documentaries. And what is your favorite thing about you? About me? Yes, uh -huh. what is your absolute favorite thing about you? Gosh, these are hard questions now. You don't oh want to ask me more questions about Reiki? You don't want to ask me more questions about Reiki? It's about you. This is the part about you to get you to vibes with you. Um, so like a physical like aspect? It doesn't matter whether it's physical or whether it's a personality thing, whatever you choose. Or you can give me a physical and you can give me a personality. Okay, Make it so easy for you. Tattoos, yes, it's easier. I don't physical, have to I would say tattoos. Uh, huh? No, I said physical, I would say probably the tattoos. I really like my tattoos. My goal is to cover everything in tattoos. Um, wow. Personality-wise, uh, I'd like to think that I'm pretty empathetic. You like to think? <laughs> <laughs> it's I don't look at what you do when you start thinking. Oh my I think god, I the fact that yes, the fact that you work with people and we know how human beings are very demanding. And I know I know you're so I could feel that like you're somebody who gives a hundred percent to every person you see, and it doesn't matter how you feel. Once you get out there, you give a hundred percent. Isn't that right? Is That's true. what I sense about you. So this is the favorite part of my um, thing. We're getting ready to wrap up. So um, everybody on the outside who's listening, remember to share, share, share. We want to get this information out there to as many people. Also, check out Rishon. I'm going to give you her um, her um, Instagram and Facebook handle in a little while. Also, check out my YouTube. I actually started a YouTube channel, girl. So at some point, we, I'm going to definitely post this on YouTube. So for all those people who um, haven't had the opportunity to, um, to watch it live, you can, there is a digital footprint that we're going to leave behind that will bless up a lot of people in the future. 
So we have been over an hour now, and um, um, this, this segment is called First Thoughts, and uh, I'm gonna just shoot a couple words or phrases to you, and you don't have to go into any long detail, just on a, a second, whether you wanna respond with a word or a phrase, that's okay, but the rule is you cannot repeat yourself. You got that? So the first, the first one is spirituality. Women. Being a Reiki master. Best thing in my life. Wow. Your family. Uh, my backbone, my support system. Right. Your title as a G O A T. And for those people who like me initially, I don't have a clue the hell G O A T. <laughs> Why the call of these people a goat? <laughs> so share with, with us what G O A T means. And it's greatest so of all time. time. Yes. How do you feel about that title? I'm honored. I'm honored. Mm -hmm. I got this title. Sorry, it's going to be more than a second. I got this title because I have officially clocked 15,000 therapy hours. 15,000 therapy 15, hours. 15,000 therapy hours. Yep. That is amazing. That is just so amazing. And more, and more to go. More and to go. my next um, thing um, what do you think your legacy? What would you like your legacy to be? Again, I can't do this in one second. Uh, one second. Um, I no, only have... one second. You know, it's sixty seconds. Okay, good. We can do that for the sixty seconds. I do have very concrete plans to teach. I do have very concrete plans to teach, not just Reiki, but massage and the way that I do massage. And um, yeah, because being a massage goat is one thing, but your hands do actually have a lifespan. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's coming to the point where um, even though I love this, I'm not going to be able to do it indefinitely. So, uh, yes. The idea is to be able to teach. Yes. And you know what? I have to tell you because almost every, without even paying attention, I could reflect almost everybody who I know that has been traveling the world and getting massages. They always say, Malaysia, Indonesia, give the best massage. So me, you have a date when I come to Ghana. I don't think I will do massage <laughs> therapy as a as a profession, but it's something definitely I would um I would love to incorporate it in 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 a in a Reiki session or something, you know? Sure. Yeah. So, and what is your favorite memory to date? Um, I know you have a lot. I just pulled one. I would probably say the first time that I saw my husband, like physically saw him as a as a person. Yeah. But guess what? I want to know. <laughs> give me the well, juice. Give me the juice. What's so special about this guy? <laughs> we we have a mutual friend, and this was a um, you know, uh, my my husband is also a musician. Um, okay. So he plays the bass guitar, and uh, the guy who introduced us was the or is the drummer, uh, you know, for their band. Um, so I remember the first time I saw my husband, like literally, my my breath stopped. Um, wow! And I said to my friend, I said, "Who is that?" And he goes, "Oh, that's Rory." And I'm like, "So like, I'm supposed to know who is Rory?" And he goes, oh. "You know, yeah. he said this is Rory." And you know, he said, "You want to meet him?" I said, "Yes, I want to meet him." And um, that was it. Like, I, I think I knew know. immediately, he knew also immediately that this was kind of, of course, we tried to play it like really cool, like be very, you know, nonchalant and we're not very impressed and we're just going to be introduced because <laughs> Roger wants to introduce the two of us. But like, my heart was racing and, and I was getting like butterflies and calm sweating. And this is not me. I'm, I'm very chill and very calm and very, you know, zen. But oh, oh Lord, I was like having a semi heart attack. Um, oh my God, I love it, love it, love it, love it. My next um, conversation with you will be about relationships, so it's swap stories. So uh, my next question is, what is your most, um, this one is your favorite memory, and this one is connected to your most favorite or uh, childhood memory? Um... 
Mm-hmm. So I have yeah, uh, a my- lot of hearts, girl. <laughs> I can see your hearts popping up. Oh, that is just such a sweet story. I uh, blush now. Um, oh, my dad's uh, one of my dad's sisters. Um, we used to go over to her house. Uh, I remember when I was younger, and she has she has a, a very modest house, but. Um, I remember always it was a situation where we were very uh, welcomed and she always had some kind of food. Um, and as I grew older, if there was anything that I needed to talk to, uh, you know, talk to her about, uh, I would go over and the first thing she would do is make me a cup of tea and she'd serve it in one of these um, enamel cups. And there would usually be some kind of cracker with maybe margarine or cheese or something, you know, on it. And she would say, drink your tea first and then talk. She said, don't talk before you drink tea. So I think she is, uh, you know, one of the people that has kind of uh, really developed the relationship with uh, me and food and me and tea and, you know, therapy and this kind of thing. Oh, that is so amazing. So that's where your relationship with tea started? I think so. Because she would always drink tea first and then talk. You know, because she would I see that you would be visibly tea. upset. And she said, mm-hmm, drink mm-hmm. first and then talk. She said, if you still have tea in your cup, you're not ready to, you know, to talk yet. So, okay. and so these I were two big cups. <laughs> yeah, I could remember back in the day, the cup of tea that you used to have was no regular yeah. thing. It was yeah. always a big cup of tea. So I have two more for you before I let you go. And uh, what is your message for every woman? So if, if, if we could leave um i mean of course i believe that this is going to be around for a very long time um if facebook and instagram should disappear and we only have um an archive on youtube what message would you like to leave with every that that every woman could relate to whether you're a teenager or, or adult adult um i would say Probably uh, know your worth, trust mm. your gut, and find something that you really love and and do the hell out of it. Um, oh, I absolutely love that. So know your worth, find something you absolutely love and do the hell out of it. That is powerful. And I mean, in finding something that you really love, you definitely will discover your passion too. So the last one, love. Love. What are you oh, talking about? Uh, yeah, love. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's a rock song. Um, and one of the lyrics is, the guy will say love, and then the chorus goes, it's for suckers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sucker. Uh, you're a sucker for love like me. I love love. <laughs> no, I, I, you see, love, love is a word that for me, it, it's not just reserved for the relationship with my, my husband. Mm-hmm. I have friends that I say that I love. Um, yeah. And I'm usually the one in the group that loves everything. So I'll see a puppy and I love him and I'll eat some amazing food and I love this dish and we'll go somewhere and I love this song. I use the word love very loosely. I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but um, for me, it, it's not just something that is reserved for uh, the relationship with my husband. I have friends that I make really embarrassed when I'll be like, I love you guys. And they're like, shut up, Trump. But <laughs> yeah, I use it very loosely. So I love oh everything. I love gosh. everything. You know, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, Unfortunately, as you say, all good things must come to an end. And time really, really does fly when you're having the most amazing time and most amazing people. Everybody who took the time to tune into this broadcast, we really appreciate you. I know I could speak from um, Rishon as well. I'm going to let she, let her love you up in a minute. But I'm going to love you. Really. You know how much I really, really, really appreciate you guys. I want you to remember, take care of yourself this week. Remember to be safe. I know right now um, in Trinidad, it's something big time because we've gone on another lockdown, no beach, no this, no that. So remember to take care of your mental health because at the end of the day, we want to be able to be beyond this when the season is over. And Rashawn, I definitely want to let you know how much I love you. I appreciate you. I really um, 
I really, really appreciate you going deep with me because a lot of times um, it's very difficult for ha to have these conversations with people because a lot of us don't like scared to dig in now. And you just bear your soul with, with me today and I really appreciate it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, please give people your um, Instagram handle for people who, in, who are in Guyana. And do you do long distance um, um, uh, attunements? Uh, long distance treatments, not not long distance attunements. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So for the people who like uh, Miss Marsh, who asked earlier about a Reiki treatment, who's not in Guyana, she's in Trinidad, you can get a long distance treatment. And so I will let her put her um, information in the chat section as well as tell you where you can find her now. So give people your handle, please. Um, on Facebook, it's Moksha GY. And um, on Instagram, I think it's moksha.therapies.gy. Yes. Um, so spell it Moksha. M O K S H A. S H A dot therapies oh, therapies. T -H -E -R -A -P -I -E -S dot g y that's on instagram all right and thank you again so love up the people and then we will talk again <clears throat> uh, thank you guys for uh you know spending what is an hour and I a half to talk to you like half the way. <clears throat> but you know thank you so much for uh you know taking time to line with us um and for listening to all the craziness. <laughs> um, <laughs> but life is so beautiful. You know, leave a comment and we'll try to, you know, I will try to maybe make a reply or you can inbox me, you know, whatever. Yeah. And thank but you life is, 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 um, Thank you. Life is just so beautiful when you have the courage to pursue your passion. I can tell you that. It's it's hell of a challenge sometimes. It has its periods when you feel as though you're crazy and, and you shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I should be doing something easier. But guess what? Once you pursue your passion, everything works out. Every, 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 everything. I can tell you that. And Rashawn also told you that a little while ago. So love you, love you. Mwah, 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 mwah. Everybody have the most amazing rest of the week. And please be safe. And please remember to be kind to yourselves, okay? And thank you in advance for sharing this awesome conversation. Thank you. Talk to you soon. To the loo. Bye. Bye, guys.